Well, how many of you know uh, what tomorrow is? Monday. It's Monday. <laughs> it's a sharp one in every crowd. There really is. A total eclipse. Yeah. Your wife's birthday. Huh. I've pretty much lost control of this thing by now. But uh, yeah, it is a total eclipse. And I mention that not honestly because I think it's all that big of a deal personally, but um, thank you. But um, uh, there has been a lot of talk, hasn't there? Have you been listening to it? About this eclipse because it's seven years. Listen to this. Seven years from the last one. Ooh. Yeah. Did that give you a little shiver down your spine? And uh, so, and this is the last one, according to the experts, that will be on North America for 20 years. Hmm. Ooh. What's that? Hopefully we'll miss the next one. Well, that's where everybody, uh, all the chatter is going. They're saying, this proves, oh, here's another one. The one... Uh, seven years ago, went over seven towns named Salem. Peace. This one crosses in North America over seven towns named oh, Nineveh. There are seven Ninevehs in America. But at the center where they cross is supposedly a town named, anybody want to guess? Salem. No. No. Rapture. This is a sign from God. Seven towns named Peace. Seven towns named Nineveh. In seven years from the last total eclipse, the rapture will be tomorrow, according to the prognosticators. Amen. If it is, I'm good with that. But this has really nothing at all to do for it. Why do we know that for a fact? Someone tell me. What are we looking for? What sign are we looking for to be completed? None. None. We are waiting for no signs. There are no signs needed. You say, well, preacher, aren't there things going on? Yeah, probably are. But none of them are a sign to get ready. Do you know when you need to be ready? Already. Because the rapture of the redeemed is imminent in our age. It could happen at any moment. Now listen, if they happen to get this one right, I'm fine with that. But when it's wrong, I just want you to know that they do harm to the testimony of Christ. Don't get caught up in this foolishness, church. Because now, if it doesn't happen, as has happened with all of these things, the world will say, Pa! None of you know what you're talking about. Jesus isn't coming. Go back to your little churches and pay taxes. That will be what they say. So let's just stay focused on being ready according to the word of God. And that is our lives ready to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. And receive a reward for those things done in our body. John chapter 19 this evening. John chapter 19. When you find your place, please stand with me and honor the word of God. We're going to uh, read... Uh, in verse number 30, we'll read just a few more. We'll kind of uh, go over what we read last week in this service, and we'll read a few more. The seven sayings of Christ on the cross, and uh, uh, we continue that tonight. Verse 28, the Bible says, we read this last week. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was, a, there was set a vessel of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus had therefore received the vinegar, this is new, we didn't do this last week, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Let's pray together tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our time. I thank you, uh, Lord, that we have uh, this great record 
uh, inspired and preserved record of what you did for us in Jesus Christ and how it went on the cross and that we can live as Jesus died if we will. So I pray you'd help us tonight as we just consider this saying, the fifth saying of Christ from the cross and uh, that, uh, that uh, when he declared it is finished, Lord, I pray that you would um, just help us tonight and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing tonight and please be seated. By the way, I forgot to mention it, Jean um, Thurman has gone home from the hospital. And so uh, continue to pray for his healing and uh, getting uh, some of his juice back. But um, praise the Lord that he's out of the hospital and on the road to mending, it looks like. So tonight we're going to talk about another life that we learn of from the sayings of Christ on the cross. And we've talked about it before that really... Uh, yes, uh, we know that we're to be like Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 8, amongst other places, tell us that that is the will of God for our life, that we would be uh, conformed to the image of His dear Son. And uh, that would be, of course, uh, our goal uh, as believers, that that would be our purpose, that we would be careful in our life every day to say, uh, you know, how do I become more like Christ today? How many of you think you've already reached that point? You're completely Christ-like and you have no further to go. Anybody at all? All right, then we ought to have some work to do tonight. Amen. And of course we're not, because this goes on in our life until we see him. The Bible says that we'll see him as he is, and then we'll know him, and we'll, we will be like him when we see him as he is. That work of glorification, it's called in Scripture, uh, it began in our life, or sanctification, uh, began in our life uh, when we were saved, and continues in our life until we're in the presence of God. And then we'll be like Christ. All of the things uh, that, uh, that we are struggling with, all of the things that, that uh, maybe cause us difficulty, those things will be uh, consumed, if you will, in Christ. And we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. And I love this part of the, uh, of the verse that tells us about uh, being caught away. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so it'd be like going to church and never going home. Yeah, except way better. Because, uh, because it'll be better, because Jesus will be there. And so, uh, listen, but, but we do know that we learn of the life we're to live, not simply by the life he lived, because some of those things are supernatural, they're for signs, but by how he died, and that his death and how he died and his attitudes and his things in death are important for us as we would live our life to be like Christ. Tonight I want to talk to you about a life of victory. In John chapter 19 and verse 30, which really is the, the, the text for all of this, Jesus said these words, you're familiar with them, it is finished, and then he gave up the ghost. The work is done. Could I, could I say just a, a couple of simple things to you tonight about that? Here's number one. He did not say, that's enough. Amen? He didn't say, like, there's more to be done, but that's enough. Jed and I did that yesterday, working on the mower. We got some work done. We came to a place we couldn't go any further. It started raining, and we did not say it is finished. We said, that's enough. We'll finish it another day. But that's not what this says. What Jesus said on the cross is, it is done. Could I give you a sort of a corollary? It would be at the end of the sixth day of creation, when God looked at everything that he made and said these words, it is very good. There's nothing more that can be done. Creation could not be more like its creator than it was at the moment he finished it on the sixth day of creation. It is finished, says, that the work that began there, you remember that we've talked about this, that Jesus in the garden, when he judges sin, he says these words we're all so familiar with, that, that uh, to the woman and to the serpent. And he says to the serpent, listen, the seed of the woman is going to uh, bruise your head. He's going to defeat you. And he's there made a prophecy that God himself would come and pay the price of redemption for mankind. 
And from that time on, uh, really the Bible records how that, uh, how that pathway, how even the genealogies, they would narrow and narrow and narrow so that when the Jesus came, you could know for sure that he's the one you were waiting for. There can't be any question about it tonight. There shouldn't have really been any question about it then. But there is no legitimate question tonight as to whether Jesus Christ was the Messiah that they'd been waiting for from the very beginning. He is he was and he always will be. And he hung on the cross. I, I, I like uh, to, to remind you maybe, but of John chapter 5. You remember that? In John chapter 5, the pool of Bethesda there. And you know how that the angel would come periodically according to the gospel and, and stir the waters. And the first one that got in it, when they stirred the waters, would find healing for their ailments. And if you don't know, if you ever go to the pool of Bethesda, you can see the ruins uh, way down there now. They're way down now. But uh, you can see the ruins of the porches. Because there were like five porches at the pool of Bethesda. And these porches would have been filled all the time with people who were uh, in, in need of healing. And this was their hope. They came there hoping that somehow they could be the one to get in the water. And Jesus walked up there. If you remember, there was a man that had been uh, uh, lame for a number of years, 30 some years. And he uh, walked up there and said to him, wilt thou be made whole? And the man said, uh, well, I don't have anyone to help me. And Jesus said, take up your bed, arise, take up your bed and walk and healed him that day without the aid of an angel because Jesus can. Amen. But when he was confronted later by the Jewish leadership of the day, the religious leadership, they were challenging him as to why he did that on the Sabbath day. Now, that in its own right is a little bit like mind boggling because you see, the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders and some of them, they would have been caring for the temporal needs of the people at the porches of the pool of Bethesda. So somebody, you have to remember, had to bring those people food. And somebody had to do all those things. And that was done out of the Levitical and the priesthoods and even the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They would be involved in that kind of work in the rabbis. And so when they saw this man, they knew that he had been lame forever. And, uh, and they see him walking, carrying this bedroll. And here's what they don't say. Wow, what a great work. They say, what are you doing carrying your bedroll? And when they meet Jesus, they said, not why, how did you do that? Or thank you for doing that. They said, why did you do that on the Sabbath day? You remember that? But I love what Jesus says to them when there's a confrontation about who he is. Because this is the words in John 5. My father worketh hitherto, and so do I. And so what Jesus said and reminds us of us is that from way back, there was a work, an ongoing work of God the Father. And that work, who knows what that work was? That work was your and my redemption. The work of bringing about redemption, the work of, of bringing it through the ages, of preparing man even, and uh, all things so that in the fullness of time Christ might be revealed and Christ might go to the cross and pay. That work began in Genesis 3 and it ends in John 19. And between then it was a work every day the father did not set back with his feet up on a heavenly foot rest waiting to snap his fingers but every day he was involved in preparing what would be required for your redemption hallelujah but it was a work and when Jesus hangs on the cross and says it is finished that is a statement of tremendous victory think about it think about all of the challenges or opportunities that the, that the uh, enemy brought to try to wipe out the opportunity for the prophecy and promise to be fulfilled. You can go all the way back. I mean, you can go way, way back, and you can find out, uh, just as you study your Bible, that the enemy, uh, the enemy of your soul and mine, was trying to stop there from being a Jesus. Not just to stop Jesus, but what he tried to do was at every turn 
undo or make it impossible for the prophecy made to come to pass. You know and I know that if all the prophecy wasn't fulfilled, Jesus could not be legitimately believed to be who he claimed to be. But because every step of prophecy was fulfilled, I mean, go back, what do you think that the great flood was about and the enemy working so dynamically in man that of, on all of the people of the earth that God found one man whom he had grace on and by that kept the promise going. And you can just, I mean, you can track it down. You can watch it all the way through. You, you can watch it as it changes from Abraham to Isaac, right, to Jacob. And then there's another attempt. There's always an attempt to destroy or cut it off. And as the kings would unfold from the seed of David, now that that line is narrow, right, because it went from a seed of the woman to, you know, the house of, uh, of uh, let's see, third son Seth, and then through Noah and all of those different houses. But every time it passed through one of those sort of gateways of genealogy, the promise, that the line got narrow or didn't it okay so then it got down to the house of David of the house of David now the Messiah according to the promise of God had to come from the house of David and you know what happened the enemy got uh, got supercharged in trying to kill off the house of David you remember Ahaziah we talked about it not too long ago his mother uh, killed all of his sons he was kind of a traitor uh, you know he wasn't very stable he was the king of the southern kingdom went to help out the king of the northern kingdom got killed in that battle his mother killed his son forgot about one it's an amazingly wonderful grandmother who kills the grandson she can find and forgets about the other one but uh, um, and uh, that was Joash, and she took the throne for five years. And you got to believe and know that when that happened, the enemy was saying this, I have wiped out the bloodline of David. It is done. It is over. It'll never happen again. It can't be. Because if Joash hadn't existed, this whole thing would be, have been turned upside down. I guess we should put somewhere in this whole statement, but God, amen. But God had a plan. And but God was faithful to his plan. And God was doing a work. And part of that work was to take a young Joash and set him aside and protect him from the uh, from the onslaught of the enemy and I mean there are all of these points throughout all of that history where Satan uh, brings his forces against uh, the the promise of God trying to make it impossible for it to happen even when you get to Jesus being born what happened as soon as he was born Herod decreed that all of the males under two years old would be would be killed right? They didn't know. They were sitting in their homes. There's a knock at the door of the soldiers. They come in, take their sons, and kill them. But God knew, and God took Joseph in the night and said, take your family and go to Egypt and set him aside. Why? Well, it's this work. Do you understand that? It's the work of redemption. It didn't just happen. God had to really fight the battle. It was a war all the way along. You say, preacher, I don't like the, I don't like the idea of God fighting. Well, I don't know why. God is a great warrior. We've seen all of that. Uh, God, is, uh, God is the one who fought all of the battles and says, I'll fight the battles for you. And in fact, he said to Israel, stop trying to fight the battles in your own strength and let me fight the battles. The battle is not yours, he said, but it's mine. God is a great warrior and he's a great spiritual warrior. So when Jesus came and came of age, even in the garden, some people will struggle with this, but, but it's 100% uh, real. In the garden of Gethsemane, I just want you to go there for a minute in your mind. We'll come back to our text and a few things in a minute, but what happened in the garden of Gethsemane that night and why was Jesus in such a state that he sweat great drops of blood? And most people will tell you it's because he was trying to get out of the cross. That he didn't really want to go to the cross. He was willing if you made him, but he didn't really want to go. But I'm telling you that's not right at all. In fact, the Bible says he set his face like a flint to go to the cross. And in both his you know, deity and his humanity, he came for a singular purpose, and it was to go to the cross. That whole thing in the Garden of Gethsemane that night was about Satan trying to kill him before he got to Calvary. 
You do know a murdered Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is different than a crucified Jesus on the cross of Calvary. The Bible demanded that he would get to Calvary. And if you would understand anything at all about the Garden of Gethsemane, it's down in the bottom of the Kidron Valley, and it would go up somewhat up the side of the Mount of Olives. But, of course, there were robbers in those days. I don't know if you know it, but not everybody in Bible times walked around going, holy, holy, holy. Some of them were thieves and robbers and murderers and scoundrels. And so when you had an olive garden, you would have it on three sides impenetrable. You would have hedges, hedgerows that were so thick with those big uh, uh, thorns that they have over there so that people couldn't get through and steal all your olives. There'd really be one way in and one way out. And look at what Jesus does when he goes there. He goes there. He has now 11 of his disciples. One of them, uh, Judas Iscariot, is gone to betray him. Isn't that right? And it says that they took two swords from the upper room. And when they got there, he took all but three of them and left them at the front gate. He left them at the entry into the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he took the other three and went further in. And he said, watch and pray with me. We know tonight that uh, from the Bible that Peter was one of the two with a sword. And so there's a sword at the gate and there's a sword back up in the Garden of Eden. And then Jesus, or Garden of Gethsemane. And then Jesus went a little bit further in and he, and he began to pray. And he prayed this prayer that we have recorded. You know, uh, you know uh, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. No, 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 hear me tonight. He was not saying, save him some other way, because as eternal God, he knew that was not at all possible. He had come for this moment. What he was saying is, I don't want to die here. There's a battle that's a, almost a final battle. I believe Satan was defeated before Calvary, and I believe that his great defeat came in the Garden of Gethsemane. Say, preacher, that's just crazy. No, it's not. They're down deep in there. The Roman soldiers in the Antonia Fortress by the temple couldn't see in the bottom of that thing. It is nighttime, and they come to arrest a man who never really did anything violent at all. They come with swords and staves. Temple guards come out there. They march out as a platoon of infantrymen, and they're saying, we want Jesus. And Judas Iscariot has this all set up, and he says, the one that I kiss, he's the one. Take him. Get him, right? And they came there to killed Jesus in the bottom of the Kidron Valley in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. Why? Because from the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, Satan was doing everything he could at every opportunity to stop a Calvary from ever happening. But God brought victory through Jesus. Jesus did go to the cross. In fact, interestingly enough, if you listen to what I described to you, it's a very classic uh, defensive position for a military unit set in. Very classic. And they distributed their weapons and never used them. And when Peter did, in a burst of zeal, Jesus said to him, put that up. This is over. We're going to make it. Put your sword away. That's not how we'll do it. If I needed to fight now, I could, could call 12 legions of angels to take me out of here. And he healed the man and then walked with them. Their plot had been thwarted. Jesus would not die in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. Jesus was now headed for the cross of Calvary to accomplish the work of redemption. All along the way, the line, the plan, the program of redemption was attacked not to bring into disrepute, but to try to prevent the possibility of there ever being a Jesus and that Jesus ever getting to Calvary and paying the price for our redemption. And now Jesus hangs on Calvary. And in this process, God has been laying on him on the cross all of the sin of all mankind. And the price that had to be paid, the work that had been initiated, I mean, come on, you have to get a little bit excited about this tonight. When all Jesus said is this, it is finished. 
What's finished? That work that began clear back there and all of the battles that raged throughout the ages and all of the times that if you'd have looked at it and, and forgotten for a moment who God is uh, if, if, with Ahaziah and his wicked mother and others, you'd have thought this, it's over, it can never work. I wonder if at times there wasn't a, a quietness uh, in the courts of heaven as angels observed perhaps the things that were going on and wondered how do we get to redemption from here? How is this gonna happen? It seems hopeless. They're not eternal. They don't know all things. They're looking at things like you and I are looking at things. And they had to have wondered from time to time, will it ever happen? Will the work be done? And now Jesus hangs there, beaten, bloody, broken, with all of the sin of all mankind laid upon him. And he says this, it is finished. No more needed to be said. The work has been done. Redemption is available. The price and penalty of sin have been paid. Mankind can now come by faith and they can receive forgiveness for their sins and everlasting life. This was a victory statement. It's a statement of great victory. The battle has been won. It will not be lost. Once Jesus went to the cross, there was no possibility of this battle being lost. It could no longer be cut off. He was there doing the very thing that he had planned to do with the Father before, before the world was even created. And with all of the, those that came against it, it's done. This purpose that Jesus went there with began before there was ever creation. And they had determined within the Godhead that they would make mankind. They knew that he would choose uh, to sin against them. But because of their love, uh, they would, uh, that God would, he would, they together, that they would, uh, that they would redeem mankind. And that God himself would take on the sin of all of the world. It is an absolute uh, purpose. And Jesus declared it as he went through his earthly ministry. In John chapter uh, uh, 10, the thief cometh not but for the uh, steal and uh, uh, and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you know that when Jesus walked his first steps as a little toddler boy, he walked those steps with purpose. Those steps were steps on the way to the cross of Calvary. Everything that he did when he sat in there and reasoned with the elders as a young boy uh, and did all of that. Listen, it was according to his purpose because he had not come simply to be a good man and he had not come to be an, uh, a popular rabbi. He had come that we might have have life and have it more abundantly. And that required the work of Calvary for that to happen. In fact, Jesus' life and death was consumed in finishing this work. Every statement that he makes, everything that he does, the most casual moments that you'd find in the life of Jesus in the gospel, he's still consumed with finishing the work of redemption on Calvary. Everything about him before he went to the cross in John 17, he said this, I've glorified thee on earth. I've finished the work which thou gavest me to do. That was the gathering of the disciples. But this whole thing was a battle from the beginning to the end. And Jesus Christ, God the Son, fought in every skirmish, won every victory, defeated every enemy until he hung on the cross of Calvary, broken, bloody, and covered with my sin and said, this battle is finished. Victory. A life of overcoming victory. That's what happened there that night. Who did he defeat? Well, he defeated Satan, no doubt. We read that throughout the scriptures. Colossians chapter two and verse number 15. It says of Jesus, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Can I tell you this? This was not a close battle. While there were lots of skirmishes along the way, when it caught time for this to be done, Jesus triumphed openly over every one of the principalities and powers that would, uh, that would endeavor to keep him from winning the victory that he won on Calvary. Sin had been defeated. The penalty of sin has been defeated. Satan has been defeated. Sin has been defeated. Death has been defeated. Hell has been defeated. Well, they exist for those unredeemed, but for those who will dip in by faith to the victory obtained and declare to us in one statement, it is finished. For those that will dip into that victory by faith, sin no longer has dominion over you. Say hallelujah tonight, church. 
and, and drop the excuse that says, I don't know, I couldn't help it, it's just my nature. No, 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 that's sin. It, the, the devil did not make you do it. The devil can't make you do it if you're a child of the king, except that you should cede him the authority that belongs only to Jesus in your life. No, no, Jesus defeated. He accomplished all of that. The defeat of Satan, the, uh, the defeat really of the power of sin. He overcame the bondage of sin. He, he did all of, of those things. He won all of this. This battle was finished and he'd won a great victory there. The blood atonement that was required was accomplished. The law's requirement, all of those things in the law that say this has to be done, they were fulfilled in Jesus. No, 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 get this. Not just all of the prophecy, but all of the law. Do you understand that? 613 mitzvot, they say, or commandments. That was all, that was all completed. It was all fulfilled. Not just all the prophecies, the numbers of them in the hundreds, don't remember it tonight, but all the prophecies about the Messiah, they were filled in Jesus, but the law was fulfilled. Jesus said that he would do that in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. Why? Because it required someone who was not guilty of anything at all before the law to be able to pay the price of our atonement. Jesus fulfilled all of the law. All of that was done. He went there as a perfect spotless lamb, demonstrated by his life and holiness, backed up by his words and works. And the law's requirement had been filled and no one any longer owes in Jesus Christ anything to the law of Moses. Nothing. The one great value work. The one work of overwhelming value that matters to everyone was finished. It was done. It was accomplished. You could say in this, only because Jesus says it, but he came to do the works that his father gave him. Jesus said, the things that I do, they're not my own. The words that I speak, they're not my own. They're my father's. And I've come to fulfill the will of the father. And so you can call everything Jesus did rightly a ministry. The ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of redemption. And that's really where this life of victory accomplished on the cross intersects with our life in the living Oh, of course, it impacts our life in redemption. If this hadn't been done, if the words it is finished had never been uttered, you and I would be hopeless and without any potential to have everlasting life. But it was done. But it intersects more clearly in our life in the work of the ministries. Now, every believer has been given a ministry. In fact, God called that ministry by name. And he said that to each of us is given the ministry of reconciliation. You don't have to uh, have a title. You don't have to have an education. You have to have uh, an, an, ex uh, an experience based upon truth and faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. You certainly have to be equipped with some things. But we've been given a ministry. And that God reconciled us to himself by Jesus, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. And the truth is, is that while we sometimes get this all mixed up because of false teaching from, uh, from a great deal of history, the, the minister here, the pastor here is one perhaps, but the ministers here are every one of us. Every one of us is here to carry truth and to fulfill a role and to finish a course. And once we've been given a ministry, do you know that it's not appropriate? It's not right. We can't just simply say, hey, it's enough. In fact, that's a common thing, isn't it? I've paid my price. I've done my part. It's time for someone else now. Look, I know that there'll be changes or phases in your ministry and life as you grow and grow older. I, I know about that. I've read that book already, that, uh, that you can't always do what you once did and that there are things that have to change in your life. I'm just here to tell you that he's given you the ministry of reconciliation and the only appropriate place to take your hands off that ministry is when it is finished. And that is when you are no 
longer on this earth. You have run your race, as Paul says. You've finished your fight. You have finished your course. You've fought the good fight and you finished it till the end. No, no, no. I'm not telling you that we need to have 85-year-olds out on, on uh, canvassing, putting door hangers. On, on, say it's fine if you want to go. Uh, but uh, I'm not telling you that we need people to go beyond their physical limitations. I'm saying that we need to realize that there are no physical limitations, that God hasn't given us the opportunity to execute the ministry of reconciliation within. We take prayer requests up at the nursing home in the service if you are there today. And, and it's very interesting. Very few of them are for me. Some of them are. There's a guy there getting ready to have uh, cancer, skin cancer surgery on Thursday. He asked that we would pray for him. Of course we'll pray for him. Uh, but you know what? It's kind of funny because here's a lady sitting in a wheelchair, uh, can't get up apparently and get out of it and walk, who says, listen, pray for this man. Uh, they had a stroke and uh, he's uh, somehow related to our family and he's getting better, but he says a long way to go. Pray Pray for him. There's some evidence there that she realizes that no matter her physical state, there's a ministry that can still be carried out in her life. And every one of us has been given this ministry of reconciliation. Say, preacher, I've never felt the call. Stop all that foolishness with me. What do you mean foolishness, preacher? Here's our call. Our call is to be like Jesus. That call is without repentance. There's never a time when he goes, okay, that's good, stop now. You don't need to be any more like Jesus. You're, you're groovy. Never says that. In fact, he says this, that day by day we die to ourself until we die in him and are with him. This idea that we have to have some sort of supernatural call in order to be engaged in ministry is a debilitating idea. And I do believe that we have supernatural giftings. I believe that spiritual gifts are clearly taught in the scripture, identified as for us in the scripture, and that many of us live most of our life without knowing what ours are. And that we ought to be more diligent about finding out that. Because here's the truth. What God has enabled you to do, he expects you to do. And what God has supernaturally enabled you to do, God expects you to do. And if he's supernaturally enabled you to be a teacher of the word of God, a pastor, a shepherd of people, a missionary, uh, uh, whatever of all of those gifts it might be, whatever that is, what he supernaturally enabled you to do by spiritual gifting. And every redeemed believer has one at least, severally with, uh, to each as he will. And so, listen, what he's gifted us to do, enabled us to do, we're accountable or we're expected to do. Never to sit down and say, eh, I don't really like this pastor. I'm just going to wait it out until he leaves. Good luck with that. I'm too old to move again. I'm dying right here. We have this ministry just like Jesus did. And God through him worked the ministry of reconciliation. And as the body of Christ today, it is his intention to work the ministry of reconciliation here through us. And there's no end to it. Now, how can you lose in war? There's a few ways you could lose in war, right? You could, you could turn around and run, right? You could see the enemy and you could go like, ah, and you could turn around and run. Hopefully you've got a few uh, army guys there and they'll shoot you in the back. So you, oh, never mind. Uh, stop the desertion. You could lay down your weapons and stand still. Couldn't you? You could sit down and say, I just don't believe I'm called to fight this war. You'd become a captive. And by the way, you'll become a captive in spiritual battle if that's your approach to it. You'll become a captive. You, you could do that. You could do like the United States of America did leading up to 9-11. You know what we did? We ignored the war. We redefined it. That's what we did. We redefined the issue of terrorism as a, as a law enforcement issue, not a combat issue. The enemy took it as a combat issue and attacked us and defeated, brought defeat to our shores that day. I'm not pleased with that, but it's just reality. And the reason is, is because we ignored the war and redefined it. We're good at that, right? 
If there's something we don't like or makes us uncomfortable, we try to define it in terms that we consider moral and right. Would you just know this? That for you and I as believers, there's a ministry we've been given. Victory is necessary. Victory is given to us in Jesus Christ if we'll fight the war. But, but the truth is, is that we could completely avoid it if we wanted to. We could avoid it by never going out and trying to talk to people, couldn't we? And we would smile a lot, right? We could, we could do the just the cr- walk across the room thing. That's a book that someone writ some, writ, writ. <clears throat> yeah, hey, y'all want to get some written in, some written in? It'll be good. It'll be real good, yeah. Uh, somebody wrote years ago, and, and it, was a, it was a book about personal evangelism. This is what it said. Never say anything about Jesus to anybody. Just walk across the room in front of them in a great way or as Jesus. Listen, I'm going to tell you, your walk ought to support the gospel, but your walk is not the gospel, friend. The the gospel is the gospel. And except they would hear the words and turn at the words of truth, they would never have life, no matter how wonderfully you live. Yes, we ought to live lives that adorn the gospel, but our walk is not the gospel. But you could avoid the war. You could avoid the war easy. And I would even say we live in a generation that is a beatnik generation spiritually. You know, the ones that hang out and hate Ashbury and speak of peace, love, and Jesus, but never enter the Vietnam War. Deserters, withholders. They did drive some pretty cool VW microbuses, but beyond that, no redeemable value. And if we're not careful, we become those people spiritually, don't we? It required God to do the work to fight the battles from the onset of the promise to the fulfillment on Calvary. Battle after battle, skirmish after skirmish. And every time the enemy attacked, God was already there to confront him and defeat him. And that's why we can get to Calvary and find God manifest in the flesh, say, it's finished. The battle has ended. I have won. Satan is defeated. And the work of redemption that I was sent to do, it is done. We need to live lives of victory. Lives where we're no longer thwarted by the enemy's attire. Listen, you know how else you can, you can lose a war? Stand on the side of the enemy. Oh, you don't have to pick up a gun and shoot anybody. You just have to stand amongst his forces and leave your own. And we have that issue, don't we, in our generation? That we love to be attired like the world in our lives more than we love to be attired like soldiers of the cross. I'm not just talking about our physical clothing. I'm talking about our life. That our character, our pursuits, our passions and priorities are often those of the other side and not of the winning side. And that's how we lose the war. And so church, I'll tell you this tonight. What we find Jesus dying in is a life of overwhelming victory. And the thing that he's given for you and I is to fight his battles in his name and power that we might have victory. But before there can be victory, there must be a battle. You never win a battle. You never engage a life of victory. And from the death of Jesus, we learn clearly. Let me read to you the words of a song I mentioned to you last week. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend of grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Thy saints in all this glorious war shall conquer though they die. They see the triumph from afar by faith's discerning eye. 
When that illustrious day shall rise and all thy armies shine in robes of victory through the skies, the glory shall be thine. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. Yes, we shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. In the new Jerusalem, wear a crown, wear a crown, wear a bright and shining crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown in the new Jerusalem. Crowns go only to victors in battle. We're called to a life of victory. Christ has purchased victory. We must simply equip ourselves, be equipped, and present ourselves. Stand in the ranks of the armies of God and be willing at any cost to hold forth the light of truth that the world might see Jesus and that someday we can hear him say again in our battle, it is finished. You have fought a good fight. You have finished your course. Enter into your rest. I don't want anything else said of me. And the only thing I can do about it is get up every day and strap on my armor and seek to be used as a warrior in spiritual battle for the glory of God. Let's be a church of victors because that's how we live as Jesus died. Stand with me tonight. There are battles all around us, church. Some we know and see, others we haven't looked close enough, others just haven't manifest to us. Trust me, if you and I pay attention, there are spiritual battles that we can engage every day of our life, and you don't have to dig a hole, you don't have to search them out with a magnifying glass. They will encounter you if you present yourself available as a soldier in the fight. Help us tonight, Father. Help us to understand the cost of victory the wonder of victory, 